Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Deputy Administrator of USAID, Mr. Don Steinberg. I'd like to thank the Academy for this great honor, and uh, thank, thank you, thank you. All the applause just came from people who actually work for me, so I'm <laughs> delighted about that as well. Uh, it is truly my great honor to introduce uh, Tom Nides, who is the Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources, to address us on the issue of the broader political and diplomatic dimensions of all of the issues that we've been discussing over the last three days. Uh, I've known Tom for much of the last two decades, we worked together on Capitol Hill. Uh, Tom then had the wisdom to go into the private sector uh, and uh, has had e extraordinary experience uh, working at uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, working at uh, Credit Suisse, First Boston, a variety of institutions. He has intermixed in that uh, portfolio, a number of services for our country, including at the U.S. Trade Representative's office. Tom is known as the best friend of government within the business sector and the best friend of the business sector within the government. Uh, we all knew that Tom was destined for this kind of a networking role uh, based upon uh, a story which I've actually just learned recently. Tom comes from uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and as a high school student, uh, wanted uh, to have uh, then Vice President Walter Mondale speak at his graduation. He called the White House every single day for a space of months, and finally Walter Mondale heard about this and said, can we just turn this off by having me go and speak? And he did indeed, but that's only half the story. Tom then parlayed that into an internship in the vice president's office shortly thereafter, and it's been full speed ahead ever since. I want to introduce again one of our best friends at USAID, uh, Deputy Secretary Tom Nides.
Well done, I'm not sure I wanted that story actually told that way, but thank you. Um, <laughs> Don, forget to mention that he and I were, uh, have been uh, partners for a long time, uh, working on the Hill together. Uh, I was working for Tom Foley, and he was working for Dick Gephardt, and I worked for Tony Quello, and he worked for Dick Gephardt. So we've had a long history together, so my admiration, and uh, even after him telling that story, is still great. Um, but thank you, uh, uh, thank you all very much. And um, I want to also thank uh, my friend Ra Shah uh, for his uh, leadership, friendship, and the vision at the helm of USAID. Uh, make no mistake, uh, I am a huge fan of Raj Shah's, and you are, those of you who work at USAID, who get supported, you are lucky to have his leadership, so I am pleased to stand here in front of you uh, as a fan and as a huge supporter of this organization. I want to thank all of you for coming here, and many of you traveling long distances to find even better ways to improve people's lives. Eighteen months ago, as Don may have mentioned, I joined the State Department not from the Gates Foundation or any other NGO. I dare say I joined from Wall Street. Still, in my time here, I have learned a great deal about the work all of you do. And to start that conversation, I have learned that you all do hard jobs, and yes, you do them remarkably well. Amid disease and disasters and war in dozens of countries and scores of languages, from rural Afghanistan to the post-earthquake in Port-au-Prince, USAID and many others that are here are transforming lives, creating livelihoods, and quite frankly, getting things done. So I just want to say, this is a remarkable group. All of you are sitting here. And I know I speak for Secretary Clinton when I say I'm filled with awe and humility at what you do every day. And because no deed goes unpunished, guess what? In some ways, it's about to even get a bit harder. You'd have to live under a rock not to know that the budgets in Europe and the United States and other donor nations are getting tighter than ever. Assistance budgets, need I tell you, will be under major pressure in the next few years. That means we need to do even more to make the case publicly that we are a good investment. In this context, I want to talk about four challenges that I see. The first two in how we discuss what we do, and the last two in how we do it. First, all of us invested in the future of development need to do a better job in trumpeting how much we do and how little we spend to do it. Maybe it's because I live in Washington, where self-promotion is a favorite pastime, but if you are too humble, your accomplishments almost always get overlooked. And in this difficult budgetary climate, we have to make our case and win it. Humanitarian, security, and economic assistance in tough times are often the first buckets of spending to get thrown out. And so I've come to believe that we need to adopt a permanent campaign mindset to educate our people and to advocate for policies that we know are right. For example, most Americans think that the foreign assistance budgets make up 25% of our federal budget, even though we all know it's less than 1%. The positive side is that when asked how much we ought to spend, people say between 10 and 15%. <laughs> I say, you got a deal. 10% is fine with all of us. But to hold the ground we've already won, we need to make our case that not just it is to the already converted, for those of us in this room, but to new audiences. Which brings me to my next point. And this is the point may not be popular with some of you in this room. But we need to justify the investment in development as we seek in terms of the returns it delivers to those who pay for it. I know that the primary motivation for many of you in this room 
is to, is to basically to do the right thing and to make the world a better place for everyone. But those are not always the only motivations for elected officials that fund our work. Often in the rough and tumble political debate, we also need to speak in terms likely to convince policymakers who are rightly focused on the needs of their constituencies in these tough times. That starts, in my view, with a focus on national security, something people have proven their willingness to invest in. We need to explain to our leaders that investments in development and diplomacy will make it less likely that we will ask our troops to deploy tomorrow. Our development spending addresses the seeds of instability before they can take root and grow into full-fledged conflicts. Illiteracy, disease, hunger, poverty, these pull at the societies apart as you all know. These deep divisions, they make conflicts more likely and they create the opportunities for extremists. Today, U.S. development workers are engaged in unprecedented numbers alongside our troops in Afghanistan. Civilians take the lead in our work and our missions in Iraq, but this is not just about the wars. Development experts are critical to our strategy in places like Yemen, Pakistan, Haiti, and South Sudan, doing difficult work to lay the groundwork for stability and prosperity. And in the future you are building, the American people will be far more secure. We need to make sure that the value proposition is clear every time we talk about the work we do. Of course, proving that we are a good investment is not just about how we present ourselves. At the end of the day, it's about the substance. Our commitments to do more with each dollar, with each euro, with each pound or rupee has to be real. The entire development community, traditional donors, emerging economies, developing nations, private companies, civil societies, and NGOs, all have to think hard about how we can do more to deliver our commitments and reach our targets. And that brings me to our third challenge. As the global economy transforms local markets, we need to get better at harnessing our international economic forces to drive development. Tomorrow, coincidentally, U.S. embassies around the world will celebrate Global Economic Statecraft Day. It's our first global effort to highlight the growing focus on eco economics and markets in the U.S. foreign policy. Secretary Clinton recognizes that we cannot do diplomacy diplomacy effectively without changing the way we think about economics and markets and without understanding the profound changes that they have undergone in the last 50 years. That, as you all know, is the same with development. As you all know, 50 years ago, development assistance represented 70% of the capital flows into developing countries. Today, because of the private sector growth, increased trade and investment, and many other factors, it represents just 13%. So, we are not the only game in town anymore, but we are one of the few that can be directed strategically and deliberately. We have to think differently about how we use our assistance. Often, this requires closer ties between development agencies and the private sector not just to launch public-private partnerships, which are quite good, but to identify and seize areas of genuine mutual benefit. As someone whose career spans business and government, this has become a personal cause for me. We have to put a great deal of emphasis, rightly, on making sure that diplomats and development workers stood side by side with our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan, and in the world's most volatile places. Our next challenge is to ensure that we have business people and investors as well. To help Iraqis and Afghans and many other communities build themselves into a brighter future. 
as we've begun to see, and we've begun to see the results. In Iraq, for example, U.S. exports rose nearly 50% in 2011 to nearly two and a half billion dollars. Already, one third of all vehicles sold in Iraq are made in America. And investment and export opportunities will continue to expand Iraq's oil sector as it booms and the overall economy grows in Afghanistan. The obstacles are a little bit more significant in many ways, but there is significant advantages if we can tap them. Vast minerals, vast natural minerals, and locations at the heart of the potential of the new Silk Road. Our challenge will be to unlock these natural resources in a way that ensures the Afghan people and the regions can share in greater trade, cooperation, peace, and most importantly, stability. But working together with the private sector by applying this new economic thinking, we can help our partners build a sustainable long-term growth. And fourth, and finally, we need to recognize that often the greatest barriers to, to development are political. And we must reward countries that show that political will, that the, those who are showing the political will will be allowed to make those tough decisions. Where we see leaders willing to make tough, make tough calls, sometimes unpopular choices, we need to spark inclusive growth. We need to be there ready to help them make those tough decisions. Often, those tough choices involve giving people political and economic freedom. Nations with strong institutions, as I know all of you know, with courts and police that enforce laws fairly, and a free press that holds leaders accountable, these places are more likely to experience widespread and economic growth. And our development strategy should not shy away from encouraging these kinds of reforms. This is a driving idea behind our Middle East, North African Incentive Fund, a new proposal in our 2013 budget that many of you know, which would invest $770 million in support of our long-term economic and political reforms. The idea is to put the incentives in place to reward governments and groups that show a commitment to meaningful change. The Obama's administration's partnership with growth is another attempt to put these lessons into practice. We're working in ex intensively with our four partners in El Salvador, Ghana, Tanzania, and the Philippines to identify their biggest implement, Im impediments to growth and then coordinate the efforts of every U.S. agency to take the difficult steps to overcome these barriers. The truth is that the partnership of growth is fast becoming the model for the United States and our foreign partners. So, let me end where I started. As a person who has not spent any time, as they say, in the field, I'm in awe. The commitment, the courage, the intelligence of you and your colleagues has been, quite frankly, eye-opening to me. As you know, we live in a world transformed by a common devotion to development. A world full of lives transformed for the better. We face many challenges in the years ahead. But if we work together, and if we relentlessly improve the way we operate, then we'll deliver results. And the future will be brighter than ever. Thank you very much.